Uh, thank you, you, sir. You got to jump right up there. It's pretty. Uh, Appreciate pretty it. Thank you, Pep. You'll have no problem. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kevin, thanks for joining us. I think this is the third time that you are on stage. That's right. Spaced right. out by a few years every time, but it's over good time. to be back. Yeah, we, we've seen each other grow old over time. Yeah. Uh, except you we still both have young. a little more gray hair now. More gray hair. More. Looks, yeah. Uh, looks good on you. So I remember the first time you sort of stood me up on something because uh, it was the moment where you filmed the Dignation show That's on right. stage. And a month before that, you announced in your own show <laughs> to a million of viewers, oh, I'm no. going to grow a mustache for the show in Amsterdam. <laughs> so at the office, we said, well, then we should all also grow a mustache. And yeah, I felt awful for a month that I look awful with a mustache. And then you showed up. And we didn't have them, yeah. No, you didn't no, have sorry them. Sorry about that. But you had yeah. great, you had a beautiful mustache. I did. Breathtaking. The mustache itself, without me behind it, was OK. Yeah. But the combination I didn't like so much. So how have you been doing since the last time we spoke? Been busy, kind of all over the place. So I was out in New York for a couple of years, yeah. um, and now moving back to San Francisco this coming Tuesday. Right. <laughs> That's, I think, the first thing I, I wanted to go into. A big part of the audience is from the US. Another big part is from 70 different countries all over the world, a lot of them from Europe. And I know it's always a topic for European entrepreneurs, like, should we stay here, or is Silicon Valley the place to go? And a lot of people have uh, an incentive to keep those entrepreneurs here. But now you're moving from New York to San Francisco. What's the story there? Like, did you look at the both and conclude, I still need to be in San Francisco? Well, I think if you're on the investing side, certainly being in the Bay Area, that you're just going to have your kind of largest concentration of, of startups to, to sit down and have coffee with. Um, so you see a lot more ideas, but I don't necessarily believe that you have to be based out there. I think that's just a myth. I mean, there's, there's a, a good pool of development talent and design talent there, um, so it's probably easier to find those engineers, but um, you know, you're going to pay a premium for that being out in the Bay Area. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm seeing little kind of hot spots pop up all over the place, whether it's you know, Portland, Oregon, or now there's more talent in Los Angeles. And um, so for New York for me was specifically so I could go and kind of pursue this company and help scale this company Hodinkee out um, and grow it to where it is today. Can you, for the audience, explain what the company does? Yeah, so well, let me step back by, by telling you why I made that move. So I, I think the thing that's really interesting that's happening right now is that we're seeing the rise of really uh, niche I industries. And, and I think that this is happening in part because there is technology now with, let's say, computer vision, being able to identify objects inside of photos that um, will place the right content in front of the right people. And something I noticed here a couple of years ago is when Instagram really started adding computer vision to the recommendations of photos, you know, we had always had our known kind of social graphs, which is I know you, you know me, we become friends, and that's, that's awesome. But um, Twitter was the first one to really say, okay, I'm following someone that I don't know, and it's largely based on their interests, right? So you're following LeBron James, not because you like his cooking, but you like the fact that he's a professional NBA basketball player, right? So, so that's like a more interest-based thing, but now we have the ability to follow interests based on photographs as well. So the thing that, that started happening over like the last um, couple of years uh, is that we started getting really smart recommendations based on the content that we were liking. So I noticed that, um, you know, my friend had started this kind of high-end luxury old-school mechanical watch site, which at first glance is like, okay, who, who cares? That's not really tech. Yeah. But he started to gain a lot of traction and kind of millions of, of people started using his product. And a lot of that was driven via Instagram and the recommendations that come from there. And they've been fine-tuning that ever since. So when I go into my Discover tab, it's really interesting how specific they can get. So they can start to recommend to me just Labrador or Labradoodle dogs, but not labs and not poodles. And they know that based on the objects inside of them. So we're starting to see this kind of shift in the way that these small cottage would-be small industries can reach their audience, which can be millions of people, but it was just impossible to do that otherwise. Like back in the day, the only way you could get these products in front of people is you would hope to buy search keywords and like yeah. hopefully someone will click on them. And now it's happening for free, which when you have a company that doesn't have a lot of money to spend on marketing, if you can get in that rotation and you can get recommended content content, you can start to really grow a business. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of these 
really um, one product companies come up and start to dominate uh, and become massive industries. So for example, I guess the best way to describe it is, you know, five years ago, I used to go to the store and I would buy all of my things from one store, meaning I would get my socks and undershirts and all of that all from the same kind of store I would go to. And now, because of these recommendation engines, you know, I get socks from Stance, and Stance only makes awesome, cool-looking socks, but a lot of that discovery was happening via Instagram for free and has allowed them to become, you know, this company doing hundreds of millions in revenue um, just based on being a sock company with no physical store presence, which is amazing. Just to get practical for a moment here, yeah. because I think people are taking uh, notes and are, are listening to your point. So, first of all, to me, it's a surprise that Instagram is using this AI to find these images. I had not noticed that yet. Yeah. I, I thought the discovery was just... Computer vision, yeah. Yeah, just something. But it's actually smarter than that. So, are you an investor in Instagram? Were you? No, no, no. you no. just follow them. Well, I was How did you find this uh, out? Uh, well, so I... It's a long story there. So Kevin, the guy that started it, I was going to invest, but I was also invested at Path at the same time, so they saw this as conflict, so it didn't that work out. That was a smart choice. Um, so missed out on that one, but that, that's fine. So uh, yeah, I've, I've known him for a long time, and I, I've just watched how, as they've kind of improved over time, those, those yeah. recommendations. And how can you, like practically, how can you use that? Because what you're describing is not just... It happens automatically. It's amazing. So it happens based on your likes. So as you go into Discover and use it more, yeah. and you start to like more images, it gets very specific on what you like. But as a company, so oh, as a company, yeah, as a company, well, you, you have to produce high-quality content. All right, and so you, have you to start produce to get that. It. Yeah, so you, you produce that content, and um, you know what you do is you actually go after tastemakers that already have established presence in in this area. So for example. My sister has um, a, a plus-size women's line of clothing that she manufactures and produces. And she's like, hey, how do I get this off the ground? You know, I have like five employees. I really don't have any way to market this, and I don't have the dollars to market this. And so for me, I was like, okay, here are the, you know, 20 to 50 plus-size women influencers that you need to seek out on Instagram. And, you know, oftentimes you send them product and they just feature it for free because they, they say thank you for sending me the product. Um, or you pay them, you know, a few hundred dollars to go and, and do a, a sponsored post about it. And as they tag you back and as you start to get more likes, it starts to fuel and kind of feed into that whole recommendation system. Right. And so you start to get kind of natural distribution through that. But would it also make sense to look at these influencers' photos, take similar photos as them, and then hope yeah, I mean, that you get discovered by the same uh, audience? Yeah, certainly trying to find um, who's best at what they're doing, like looking at the, the best in, in your kind of vertical and then and mimicking a lot of that is, is key. Yeah. So can you go into the watches just yes. briefly again? Because uh, like, uh, you were the founder of Dick, you did a lot of stuff after that, and then at one point somebody said, Kevin is going into classic watches. I'm like, what? You know, like yeah. He's going to sell his watch collection online? What is this? Well, I'm I mean, sure there's more to it. It's an industry that is, is not largely not been touched by technology. Um, the companies for a long time believed that you had to have a brick and mortar store in order to sell you know, expensive timepieces online. It's a double digit, billion dollar a year industry. So I believe in this idea that there has to be um, future e-commerce, especially when you're talking high dollar e-commerce, is going to be a blend of content and commerce. And the content creates the trust. And so when I got together with Ben um, over at Hodinkee, he'd had seven year track record of creating trust with his readers. And so having that trust and then taking that e-commerce, I, I came in and built out all the e-commerce and the mobile apps and all of that, and blending that together, uh, it really enables you to do things like sell very expensive timepieces online. So, you know, we still, I believe to this day, hold the world record for an Apple Pay transaction, which was $175,000 done via a thumbprint out of, tax, uh, out of Texas um, from someone that bought a watch sight unseen. Right. And so, you know, this idea, I believe that kind of brick and mortar is going away in this space, and that not going away, but it'll become more kind of boutique-y and, and yeah. on, you know, Fifth Avenue and some very fancy places. But um, a lot of it is moving online. And so I really just wanted to come in and help him build that brand. And, and for me, getting to New York and getting um, out of the Bay Area and kind of seeing a little bit more 
diversity than yeah. just all tech all the time was a, was a nice break as well. I get that part, yeah. It, it just seemed so analog just at the time when the Apple Watch was being introduced. Wearables are a whole topic. So can we go into that oh, yeah. a little bit? Like, I mean, at are, the do low you wear end, an Apple Watch at all? Is no, it, or other no, stuff? no, I actually have an Aura on, which I think is a lot cooler than the Apple Watch. Oh. I don't know if you've seen the, the no, Aura. No, I haven't. Check that out. Can you explain what it is? It's, a chip, it's got yeah, a chip so built is, in. This is a new, a new ring. Um, so this Aura ring does uh, you know, all the stuff that you would think in terms of, um, it's spelled O-U-R-A, um, in terms of like um, heart rate and everything else. But the thing that is really interesting is because of the proximity and closeness to the skin, meaning that it's not on a loose band, it's actually really tight against the finger, allows it to measure uh, variable heart rate. So that's the milliseconds between beats. And that is what professional sports team use to uh, assess readiness. So your heart actually becomes less variable as you get more fatigued. And so in the morning when I wake up, I can go in and see how ready I am to train for that day, how fatigued I am, and, and then work out appropriately. And then also, it's, it's the best at, um, at figuring out the different sleep states. So having that heart rate var variability allows you to see not only like light and, and deep sleep, but REM sleep. The deep is the, really the hardest to get. So it, it's just a beautiful app, and, and it's really, I mean, I think this thing, the next generation I heard is going to be about half the size, so it's a little clunky right now. But I, I'm really excited for the, the kind of future of, of wearables to go to the ring. All right. So I, I spoke to uh, Werner Vogels of Amazon, and he talked to me about the uh, post-mobile era. So he says, uh, you know, mobile phones are the biggest thing. It's, it's a product, Apple says, it's a product that's unlike anything we'll ever uh, experience in our lifetimes, time, probably, because it's, it's a thing that now everybody needs to own. And they, you know, television, you share it, but the phone is, like, on you. Um, but he said in 10 years there won't be mobile phones anymore because all the technology is just going to be in a ring or in your house, just hidden away. It's going to be automated. And I, I thought that was inspiring and interesting because some, some days I'll wake up and my morning seems like I'm working for my phone because I just got to check all the red dots and, and make yeah. them disappear. So what do you think about that, like the future of mobile or post-mobile? I mean, I think it's just a, a, I hate that it's actually called a phone. It's actually not used as a phone. It's a computer. No. Yeah. So it's like you have just another form factor of a computer that you carry around with you. I always wonder if Apple regrets calling it the iPhone. Yeah, I mean. that's the least used app on the thing, so. Yeah, it would be like calling a laptop like a Skype book or something. You're like, <laughs> that's, you do more than just yeah. Skype with it. So, um, you know, I just think it's going to be, you know, the idea of using speech to interact with everything is, is certainly the, the next big push that yeah. I think has real, real legs. I, I, I'm not a big fan of bots. I'm not a big fan of VR. I think uh, AR is, is likely um, to be a thing. Yeah, what but part? What, what applications do you see for AR? Well, I mean, just in the, the, the sense of it being something that is a little bit more um, of, of a multi-person experience. The, the issue that, uh, that VR has always had is, you know, I, I remember during the first kind of big hype of this a couple of years ago, and I, I wrote a blog post I was about saying how I just, just, just did not like virtual reality, and I got a lot of flack for it, and it was because I, I just, I feel like if, you're not going to be sitting there watching a sports game with like the helmet on. And, and it was also the combination of technologies, like it being very clunky and cords connected and everything else. It's just not ready for prime time. And that won't be, that'll be the case for, for many years to come. So it wasn't an experience that was a must have or a, a true kind of order of magnitude improvement over what we have today. Right. And those technologies that, that really don't grab you and pull you in and keep you in there, they tend to just fade away with time. I mean, it reminds me of like when 3D television came out. We were all so excited. We've got our 3D glasses at home. And then the little battery that's a watch battery dies, and you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm not going to take the time to go to the store and figure yeah. out how to replace it. Yeah. And the same thing with, like, the Wii U. And there's a novelty to it, and there's something fun about it initially. I think hardcore gamers will absolutely continue to use these devices. But yeah. um, I, I don't see the, the kind of practical day-to-day -day application that, that most people think it's, it's going towards. Yeah. So you're still an investor. You used to invest at uh, Google Ventures. Uh, what is your area of interest now? What technologies do you think we might be overlooking? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of, for me, I think my best investments have always been made um, not in a, in a rush, but taking my time and really doing two to three deals that are just must-haves. And so that's a combination of, like, the idea being the part that attracts you and then the team being the part that really sells you. And... Um, 
you know, I, I keep a close eye on all the different blockchain technologies that are going on right now. I think that um, this idea of distributed apps uh, via Ethereum and these uh, initial coin offerings as a means of funding is really interesting. Um, I have yet to see kind of one of these D apps, these Ethereum apps that is more than just like a poker game or something like that. And the idea of having to, the, the, the problem with a lot of these technologies is that you have really geeky, hardcore people creating them, which is awesome because they, they do all the heavy lifting. You just don't have anyone slapping a beautiful, usable interface on them. And so it tends to be a really niche, kind of geeky thing still. And, you know, I'm not going to explain to my mother how to, like, use, like, a, a, a hex code of, like, 25 characters to, like, pay me for something. Yeah. So there needs to be a layer of tech on top of those, like, geeky technologies that makes it accessible to the average user. I was, I was trying to use a, a distributed um, uh, Ethereum app the other day, and I had to use Chrome, and I had to uh, install an extension that allowed me to, to download that portion of the blockchain that had all of that distributed data. And I, it was, like, 15 minutes just to even get, and that's like for someone that's pretty tech savvy. Right, right. Imagine the average common user. So we're still in the very early innings of this kind of stuff, um, but it's certainly something to, to kind of keep your eye on. Oh. Um, that's, that's been exciting for me. Um, the health and wellness space, I, I've been, you know, I met with a company the other day that True's actually an investor in that does real time glucose monitoring via a patch that goes on your arm that's really interesting. Um, that's something I'm passionate about. And certainly uh, technologies that, that help us kind of find a balance. Um, I think that too much tech all the time is something that is um, leading to kind of distraction later in life. Distraction being a, a, a big problem with people not being able to keep their attention. And so, um, you know, I'm building a meditation app right now to kind of help with that that I'm going to be giving away for free. And What's it called? Uh, it's called Oak. Right. Oak. It's, not out, it's not out yet. I'm, in, I'm kind of just like using it to some, some beta testers are yeah. on it. And but. what's the philosophy there? Like, w w w because I noticed the same thing. It's, uh, we're now in an era where everybody sort of makes a living uh, and they're looking for the next step. They want to feel important. Uh, uh, and meditation seems to be a thing that, that comes into play there. Yeah, well, so I think anybody that's been doing kind of our job or any of you that I'm sure work in technology, you just, after a certain number of years, you, you feel it. Like you feel like, oh God, maybe I need to find a little balance, you know? I, and so- You look in the mirror and you see the gray hairs and you're like, <laughs> oh my God. It yeah. just kind of weighs on you a little yeah. bit, you know? And so just trying to, to kind of plan out my day and, and my life so I can find that kind of moment to, to take a break and reset a little bit, right. I think is gonna be a big thing for people in the future. And so I kind of wanted to just create something that, that that is, and uses technology to improve meditation. So a lot of what we're doing right now is really going really deep with these individual meditators, like hundreds of them, collecting survey data and data points about when they leave the meditation, um, and, and really refining the script and refining um, the entire process. So it's not just like, you know, traditionally most of these, most of apps out there, and some of them are wonderful apps, they just write their guided meditation and they send it out to everyone. They're like, okay, done deal. I, I want to use more data and, and collect a lot of data and really try and hone in and refine this to have the best possible experience for the new user. Right. And so that's what I've been spending a lot of time on is trying to really um, make that happen. So it means a lot of little tiny tweaks and revisions based on the surveys and, and data that we're collecting. You're not boring. I'll give you that. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you so much. Have Appreciate rose. it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Boris.